Good morning, my YouTube viewers. Crystal here. I'm here this morning because I wanted to make another video for you. Uh, this video is again on the radius neighbors, and the reason why is because I had um, such good luck on the radius neighbors. Uh, the last blog post that I made, I decided that I wanted to try radius neighbors out on the Titanic data set to see if I could improve my score on the Titanic data set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a code review and show you what I did with the Titanic data set and what I did to try to improve my score and what the score was. So I think the title of this video is going to be is radius neighbors a suitable model for the Kaikagel Titanic data set. So the first thing we'll do is we'll start out this video by reading the problem statement for the Kaikagel Titanic uh, competition. The sinking of the Titanic is one of the most famous shipwrecks in history. On April 15, 1912, during her maiden voyage, the widely considered unsinkable RMS Titanic sank after colliding with an iceberg. Unfortunately, there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone on board, resulting in the death of 1,502 out of 2,224 passengers and crew. While there was some element of luck involved in surviving, it seems some groups of people were more likely to survive than others. In this case, we ask you to build a predictive model that answers the question, what sorts of people were likely to survive using passenger data, i.e. name, age, gender, socioeconomic class, etc. Well, I can answer that question for you right now because I've been working on this Titanic data set for a long time and um, it's basically women and people who had tickets for the first and second class were more likely to survive than men and people who had tickets for third class. That's one thing that I found out while I've been working on the radius neighbors. Sorry, while, the, while I've been working on the Kaggle Titanic data set. Um, but the thing is, is that what they say is the people who are scoring really well on this data set are people who are going in and researching the winners and then writing the program just for the winners. And I do actually have a data set that's got the 1309 and it says whether they survived or didn't survive. And I suppose if I was really ingenious, I could have programmed, um, written a program on the survivors. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to write a program the way you're supposed to write a program. But it looks like because of all of my efforts, the only way you're going to get 100% really is if you go through and write a program based upon these survivors, which is not what you're supposed to do. But I'll keep trying. I'll keep trying to find a model that will enable me to score higher than what I have scored. So um, I wrote this program in Google Colab, but I went and copied and pasted it into Kaggle. So we're actually on the Kaggle website right now and what I've done is I'm sharing this website. I'm sharing the website uh, so you can, if you know my name and, and you're able to go into Kaggle, then you can find it. And it looks like I've had 19 views so far. It says, it said I did the video 19 minutes ago, sorry, five minutes ago, and it says 19 views so far. So people are actually viewing this 
website and basically what they'll do is they'll go through and look at all the new websites to see if they can find any new tips and tricks on the website but I don't really do that because um, I'm making blog posts now and I'm getting paid to make blog posts so I have to make sure that I do a post every single day so if I wanted to I could go into the Titanic and look every single day and see if there were any uh, new notebooks that had any new tips or tricks in it but I don't do that because I just concentrate my efforts on other things but at some point I might when I run out of things to write about I might actually do that but I haven't run out of things to write about so far so I won't do that for the time being so when I wrote the program initially what I had to do was I loaded the libraries so I wrote, loaded in Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. So NumPy is your library that allows you to carry out algebraic functions. Pandas is your library that allows you to work on um, the data frames, and it's written on the back of NumPy. Matplotlib is a graphics library, and Seaborn is a graphics library that's written on top of Matplotlib. And then after I did that, what I did was I uh, imported the OS operating system and I looked to see where all my files were and I retrieved the files that were in the Kaggle Titanic directory and the three files were train, test, and gender. After I loaded those files up, I read the files. And so you can see how we read the files. After I read the files, then what I wanted to do was I wanted to define to x, tote, and y, because I decided I was going to try to use a different methodology today to see if I could increase my score if I used a different methodology. So y equals train dots survived, train bless y equals train dropped survive, and then you can look at train less y. So train less y is in the format of the test data set because it's exactly because it's the same data set, it's just Y is dropped because you're not going to need the Y. Okay, so train X tote equals train less Y append test. So what we did was we appended the test file to that. And X tote equals X tote drop passenger ID axis. So you don't really need passenger ID. But what I could do is I could, like, it just says you don't need passenger ID, but what I could do is I could take out that drop passenger ID and see if it improves my score. And what I could do, I know that you can't see this. I know you can't see this. But what I could do here is on my website, in Google Colab, just just I'm in Google Colab at the moment, even though you can't see it. I'm gonna put a little what I'm trying to do just to see if my score increases if i leave the passenger id in there that's what i'm doing even though you can't see it and then if it increases my score then i'll do it on the kaggle data set
Okay, so now I'm on Kaggle data set and I'm running it just to see if my score increases because I have noticed when I was working on, I believe it was the iris data set, when I left the past, when I left the ID number in there, it actually improved the score. So for some reason, I don't know why it improved the score. So what I'll do is come over here to edit. Don't ask me why it improves the score when you leave passenger ID in there. But um, we'll just see what happens. I noticed that when we were working on Iris, that it improved the score. Maybe it helped separate things better. Okay, let's try run haul and hope for the best. No, it didn't improve the score. It gave you a one here. It gave you one here with your passenger ID, but it gave you all zeros on the array. So that means that it didn't improve the score. So at least now we know, even though it said, I mean, the thing is, is that here's what you got with your prediction. And when you got that with your prediction, it's all zeros. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. And now that I know it came up with 100 percent on the extra wide time but it didn't come up with a hundred percent and so it didn't work I know you can't see it because I'm in the other it was a nice idea though wasn't it because it did actually give you 100% on the X train Y train but it didn't give 100% so I'll just run this again on the so yeah, it was a nice idea, wasn't it? You can always give it a try eh? and see see what happens, see how it works out. But it didn't work out today. So what we'll do is since it didn't work out, We'll take the passenger ID out here. And then what we'll do is um, we'll just take that out. And we'll run it again. And you can see it worked. So that passenger ID does actually make a difference. 
But on the iris data set, it worked out better when you use the ID number. So that's why you need to experiment on it and see if it works better with or without the passenger ID. And that's what they call feature selection. But you know, in this particular situation, it didn't work. So this is our X tall with the passenger ID dropped. And then now what we do is we check for null values and we have null values and three columns, which is the age, the cabin and the embarked. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop the cabin and the ticket. And we're just going to focus on the um, weather on on the fair and the reason why is because if you look at the cabin you've got a lot of NANs uh, and the tickets you've got a lot of stuff in the tickets so I think probably perhaps if I had wanted to I can work on it you've got a what they say is if you have a lot of NANs, then drop the columns with the NANs. Um, and I'm not sure that um, it's going to help because I've got so many NANs anyway. I'm not sure that it's going to help. And see, the tickets have lots of different numbers in it, and you don't know what the ticket is going to say. So that's why I dropped the cabin and the ticket. So, um, so now that we've dropped the cabin and the ticket, the only thing that we have left is the age and the embark that we have to work on. So what I decided I was going to do was I was going to replace all null values with zero. So you can see here where all null values are replaced with zero. And then I'm going to impute those three columns. So I'm going to fill all on the age. I'm going to fill all null values with median. On the fair, I'm going to fill all null values with median. And in bar, I'm going to fill all null values with mode. And then so what I do is I check my null characters again, and I don't have any null characters anymore, which is what I want. So now what we're going to do is we're going to um, and do an analysis on the survived. So you can see 549 people survived, and no, 549 people perished, and 342 people survived. That was just from what we had on the uh, Kaggle Titanic data set or the train data set. The percentage of these survivors on the train data set was 61.62% survived and 38.38% no 61.62% didn't survive and 38.38% did survive and that was on your train data set. So this is your train data set, and it gives you a graphical representation. So now what we do is I just gave you a little scatter plot. So you can see how all of the uh, survivors mingled in with the non-survivors. So the non-survivors are in red, and the survivors are in green. And you can see up here we've got a few outliers. Now what I did was I made a heat map. So I made a heat map. So if you like heat maps, then what you can do is you can analyze how the different variables interrelate with each other. So um, if it's sort of a purple cerise, then it's neutral. And if it's a black, it's um, negative 0 0.04. And then if it's a white, it's a 1.0 and then if you're into heat maps 
and you know how to read heat maps and you can do that. So now what we do is we're going to take the title. So we're going to extract the title. And what I decided to do in this instance was I decided to do a value counts. And then when you do a value counts, then you can find out how many instances of each title there are. So now what we're going to do is we're going to map the title to create a new column called title. Now what we're going to do is we're going to check the sex of all the passengers. And so you had um, 466 female and 843 male. And we're going to check the um, percentage. So 35.6 were female and 64.4 were male. And then you can have a little diagram that shows you the percentage of females to males. Now what we're going to do is we're going to check the class. So you had 323 in first class, 277 in second class, and 709 in third class. So we've got the percentages. You've got 24.68 in first class. 21.16 in second class and 54.16 in third class and that was your percentages and so now we've got a graph that gives you a visual representation of the three classes now we've got our ages and i plotted a violin chart for the ages so you can see that and so the median age was between 20 and 40 and I think it was around 28. So you can see the max age was 80, the minimum age was just a newborn, the median age was 28, and the most frequently most frequent age is 28. Now we're going to check the fare. We've done a violin chart on the fare. So the max fare was 512 pounds, the min fare was zero, the median fare was 14.45, uh, and the most used fare was 8.05. Now we're going to check Embarked. So you, Embarked was from three locations. One of the locations was Southampton, but I don't remember what Q and C are from, or I think C was Chalfont, I think it was, but I don't remember what Q was. So C was 270, Q was 123, and S was 916. So most people departed and barked from Southampton. So now we've got the percentages. So 20.63% were from C, 9.4% were from Q, and 69.98% were from S or Southampton. So now we've got a diagram that I've plotted so you can see for yourself that most of the embarks were from Southampton. So now what we're going to do is we're going to ordinal and code the columns and I decided that I was going to use mapping and the reason why I'm going to use mapping is because when you use the ordinal and code function in sklearn you're not you don't have any control over what's going to be one and what's going to be two and what's going to be three etc but if you use mapping then you, you can decide what's going to be 1, what's going to be 2, and what's going to be 3. So that's why I use mapping. But if I had wanted to, I could have used the 
ordinal encounter in SKLearn. And one thing that, you know, I had originally was doing was using a lot of the functions in SKLearn, but I'm sort of trying to get away from that. I'm sort of trying to get down to the basics of coding because if you get down to the basics of coding, then you have a greater understanding of what it is that you're doing. So now what I'm doing is I'm converting age and fair to integer because I just thought it would be easier for the model to predict on data if it was an integer, but it still didn't make that much of a difference. Did I define my features? So features equals P class, title, sex, age, sib, sp, part, fair, and bar. And x tote equals x tote features, and then you've got x tote, and you've got here everything is numeric, and that's what the model wants to see. The model wants to see numbers before it can predict. So now what I've done is I've normalized x tote, and x tote equals x tote minus x tote min over x tote max minus x tote min. So now you can see the normalized um, values. So now what I've done is I've defined my train and test set. So rows equals lin train, x train equals x tote rows, y train equals y, x test equals x test rows as well. And if you hadn't appended the uh, train and test together, then you could have used SKLearn's train test split. But I just decided that I wanted to see if I could get a higher accuracy if I appended the train set and test sets together. Because they say that if you want to get a better accuracy, you need to use as much data as possible. And I was just hoping that doing it this way would improve my score. So now what I did was I wanted to select my model. So I use radius neighbors classifier. You can either use K neighbors classifier or radius neighbors classifier. And there's a section on it in SK Learn if you want to read it. And I got a 96%. So that was a good percentage. And since I got such a high percentage, I just thought, wow, if I got 96%, I should get a better accuracy on my test set. So now what I'm doing is I am predicting on the test set. And you can see we've got array with our predictions. And then our output we put that onto a CSV file, we created a data frame, and we converted the data frame to a CSV file, and then we uploaded the data frame so you can see it. And then what we did was we, um, we converted it to, we, uh, what we did was we saved it, and then after we saved it, what what we did was we um, submitted it. But you won't be able, unfortunately, I can tell you that the submission that I got whenever I saved it and submitted it, it was like 0.715. So we lost about... 25% accuracy from the predicting upon the um, training set and then predicting on the test set. And I know that you won't be able to see the accuracy. I don't know if you saw the accuracy at the very beginning of the, um, I don't know if you saw the accuracy at the very beginning of the program but um, it was like 7.71.5%. And you can't see what I'm doing now because what has happened is this screen recorder 
that I'm using only allows you to see one site. But I am pressing submit and I'm submitting and I'm viewing my submissions and I've got 71531. So yeah, we lost about 25 points. We lost about 25 points um, between uh, training and fitting the model and then predicting on the test set. And I don't know why that is, but that happened because I just thought that when I got such a high percentage on training and fitting, I just thought, well, surely my percentage accuracy is going to increase on the prediction but it didn't it didn't increase and you may have seen this at the very beginning of the video but my accuracy is only 71.531 percent so the solution to the question is no radius neighbors is not necessarily the best model for a Titanic um, but I can try to use some other models and see if my score increases so I think that pretty much concludes this um, presentation um, I hope that you got something out of it I showed you a new way that you can um, train and fit your model and predict on the test set. Unfortunately, we didn't get the really good results that we were hoping to get, but that's all in the name of science. And maybe one day when I have like run out of things to write blogs and how maybe I'll go through and I'll try to program the program so for the survivors, but that's not what you're supposed to do. People do that, but you're not supposed to do that. So I think this concludes my presentation. If you like my presentation, please like, subscribe, and share. If you want to uh, be notified whenever I make a presentation, please press on the bell button next to the subscribe button, and you will be notified whenever I make a new presentation. If you like the work I do and you want to support me, then I've got my email address to my PayPal account in the description box below. And um, thank you so much again for watching my videos. And I look forward to making more videos for you in the future.